What up, though? Welcome to Gangsta's Paradise Podcast. This is where I kick cautionary street tales. I'm not here to encourage folks to join gangs, cliques, mobs, or crews, but this is a fair warning if you choose to cross that line. Welcome to another episode of Gangsta's Paradise. Make sure y'all subscribe to the channel. I want to send a salute to Scotland and England over there in the UK. Thank you for checking out the show. I want to send a shout out to North Carolina. Salute. Thank you for checking out the show. This episode, I'm going to take it to the Supreme Team of the Borough of Queens, New York City, South Jamaica neighborhood, Jamaica, Queens, headed by Kenneth Supreme McGriff and his nephew, Gerald Prince Miller. Now, when you're talking about the Supreme Team, this is one of those ultra popular crews that came out of the 80s. And I look at the height of the crack era between 1984 and 1994. Other people may have their notions of when they think the height of the crack game is, but in my opinion, it's between 1984 and 1994. Some of those crews out of the 80s were extremely popular or got to the point where they became extremely popular. The media started covering some of these stories, which adds on to the popularity and the mystique images these some of these crews had, which makes it, you know, the public makes makes the public want to be more interested in hearing about those stories. Supreme Team, you can find out about them online. It's public information, but again, it's a part of that era where crews and guys was supremely popular. Supreme Team. Uh, when you look at Detroit, you had the, the Chambers Brothers or Demetrius Holloway. You go to the West Coast, you had Freeway Ricky Ross and the guy up there in Oakland. Uh, go down to Houston, you got Jay Cotton. Go down to New Orleans, you got the Mets gang. You know, during that era, during the 80s, during the, I believe, is one of the toughest parts of the crack game, these crews and people, you know, they became extremely popular. And the Supreme Team is one of those crews. South Jamaica is a residential neighborhood in Queens, located south of downtown Jamaica. I got family in the adjacent community, St. Albans, and New York is one of my favorite places to visit. I love the the skyline down there. Like I said, I got family in Queens, Brooklyn, um, different places in New York City, but I love to visit New York City, and South Jamaica, Queens is adjacent to say Albans, you know, go shopping down on Jamaica Ave and things like that. And if you hear an artist from Queens and they mention the Ave, they're usually talking about Jamaica Avenue. Queens has several historical legendary artists or hip hop artists that come from, come from there. Ja Rule is one of them, Tribe Called Quest. LL Cool J, the legendary Run DMC. So a lot of those images that artists was projecting, they they got that from people like the Supreme Team. These guys were big popping and queens. The Supreme Team was a crew that was organized in the early 1980s around Baisley Park houses in Jamaica, Queens. It was a group of guys who were members of the 5% Nation. The 5% Nation, also known as the Nation of Gods and Earth. If you listen to a lot of hip-hop artists, I know particularly back in the day, maybe some would do it nowadays, uh, the New York-based artists, they would use the word God in a lot of their lingo. That's one of those words they just use commonly in New York. And I believe it's because the uh, the 5% of uh, groups like uh, organizations like the 5% Nation. And it's based around the religion of Islam. Most OGs or old heads when it comes to the crack game, and you can see it in a lot of interviews, they say, well, when do you think crack took off in your neighborhood or your community or your city? Most people will say around 1984. Now, it was around before the end, but far as it starting this widespread, is about to go nationwide. This is around 1984. Between 1984 and 1985, guys were capitalizing. Now you got this new richness in the hood. 
And many of those guys took those richness and, and flown it. It became a stage. It's all about who got the biggest, who got the best. You know, there's a lot of power struggles that went along with the era, any other era. You know, but this the brand new drug on the scene. You know, you got new guys and new hustlers on the scene. These ain't the old school 70s hustlers that used to have the streets on lock. And the Supreme Team falls up under a banner of a guy named Lorenzo Nichols or Fat Cat. Fat Cat was one considered one of the biggest drug dealers on the East Coast at, at that time. And the Supreme Team, as they say, worked along under, under this banner. And this Fat Cat banner had a few cats that worked along with that. Glazer's crew, the Eminem crew, that fell up under the Fat Cat banner at that time. Pappy Mason, a guy named Mike Bones, the Supreme Team. So Fat Cat had a crew of people that was out there hustling real hard. He had a major team going on in the streets of Queens at the time. It was a tie draw, Prince Miller, he was running the crew. And then you had other cats that was running the crew as well when guys was locked down. You got a guy named Bimmy. He does interviews and, and he talk about a lot of those stories and dealing with Prem and how he was holding it down while Prem was locked up. And you had another guy named Black Just, which is another important part of Supreme story. But those guys were uh, running the crew at, at a point in time. And this episode really could go along with the Rap Gangland miniseries because, you know, a lot of this, uh, you got locked up from dealing with rappers. He was dealing with a lot of rappers at the time. You know, he had this thing going on with 50 Cent. He was kicking it with Ja Rule, and, and he tried to get into the entertainment field himself. You know, so I could easily put this under the Gangland miniseries. Um, but a lot of people who mention Prem and No Prem, they take them back to that, that crack era in Queens. Make sure y'all subscribe to Gangsta's Paradise. You can go over to YouTube and check out some of the material over there. It's Gangsta's Paradise TV One. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Click that like button and make sure y'all click that like button on this episode and subscribe to the podcast. This podcast is available on, on most major podcasting platforms. You can go to Spotify, you can go to Amazon Music, or you can go to castbox.fm. I appreciate it. 50 Cent was another guy that grew up in South Jamaica, so he's well uh, familiar with the Supreme Team, even though Fat Cat you know, was the big dog, but he really looked at Supreme like he was like the godfather of the streets. He held Supreme in, in really high regard. He had a lot of respect for Supreme during that time, especially when he was running around in the streets and all that. I do believe Supreme was one of those guys that the law enforcement wanted to find some type of way to get this guy locked up. Uh, I believe that they thought that Supreme had slipped, you know, slipped through that, that sweep of the 80s crack dealers that caught those long prison sentences or they may have died or something like that. So in my opinion, they wanted to get this guy locked back up. But they more or less wanted, wanted him to trip himself up and get himself locked back up versus them trying to set him up to get him locked back up. The crew came in numbers, and so they were able to bring in a lot of money. They had a lot of people working for them on the streets, and they were bringing in that bread during the crack era. I don't look at this crew like they were wholesalers. It looked like they were more into selling crack. And they took that money and they, they bought a lot of nice things. They, they rubbed elbows with celebrities. They would hire these rappers to come to their parties because they had the bread to do it. Then on top of that, it's sort of the rapper has to pay the homage because y'all basically living off of their images. You know, it's just a thing in the music industry where I ain't, I'm not saying that these artists they sign are not real. But they go get these artists and make them into game bangers and stuff like that. It's like exploiting the, the street culture. It's like the person go through everything. Then you got the other rappers emulating that. And they live the life of the, the lifestyle of the rich and famous. So, you know, it's like a, a double-edged sword. 
It's like you're on the streets and you're showing the world the game, but the, the world get paid off of it and you don't. Your payment is to go to jail for the rest of your life. He caught a case in 1989, went away on a continuing criminal enterprise charge, got out around 94, and this around the time gangster rap was in full swing, Death Rose in full swing, Tupac a star at the time, uh, Bad Boy starting to come on the scene. The West Coast is primarily dominating the hip hop scene at the time. You know, they had the, the hot sound. Every, a lot of people was digging, you know. And then on top of that, uh, the East Coast, West Coast stuff that's, that's starting to come into play around 95, somewhere up in there. Uh, then he went back to jail. He went back to jail on a violation. He got out around 97. So when he got out this time, Ja Rule and other people uh, around Queens, they started to get hot. By this time, Tupac is gone. Biggie is gone. So it's like in the music industry and as a hip hop fan, it was like a void that was missing right there. And I believe that Def Jam thought of Tupac. And when I look at Tupac, it seemed like to New York artists, at least when he was around, like Tupac was like the biggest thing popping. Like he was a real superstar in New York City. It's like a lot of artists really dig Tupac out that way. And Biggie was one of them. And obviously, Ja Rule was one of them. So, in my opinion, when those guys passed, Def Jam was in the frame of mind, like, who gonna fill these voids of Biggie and Tupac? So, that's where you entered Jay-Z at. Uh, I believe he would not be the superstar that he became if Biggie was still around. In my opinion, it's no disrespect to him. And I'm a big fan of Jay-Z. Like, I like his work. you know. But he sort of filled that void of that Biggie. And Ja Rule and DMX, they supposed, supposedly had filled that void of Tupac, but DMX quickly threw that Tupac theme away. He wasn't with it. I'm not the next Tupac. I'm DMX. And that's how he laid it down. He got rid of that Tupac. I'm the next Tupac thing like early on. Ja Rule sort of held on to that thug life, Tupac ish type of image. I love Ja Rule. He made commercially pop hip hop records, and I don't think nothing is wrong with that. I think it's needed in hip hop. That way, you don't have all these gangster, you know, we try to kill up everything type records. You need those those poppy type records. So I was all with that. You know, I love Ja Rule as an artist. When he first came on the scene, I was like, they get into a battle or something, Ja Rule gonna live. He gonna lose that battle because nobody's gonna take him as an image of a, a mafia boss or something like that. You know, he just, it just wasn't him to the public. He may be like that in real life, but as a hip hop artist, looking at him as a fan, we just didn't look at him like he was gangster like that. So that's just being honest. I love the guy, I love his work, I love his music. I thought he should have kept making that music. I thought he should never got into no battles with People like 50 Cent, I thought he should have just kept doing what he was doing. I like those records, <laughs> me personally, so. Ja Rule was the man, or is the man. But how I look at Murder, Inc. is like one of those labels. They make commercial type music but they want to have the street type of image, maybe like a death row or something like that. They wanted that street image. They wanted that, that hard edge to them if, in terms of image. And when you look at a lot of guys that's in the hip hop or music uh, uh, in the entertainment field, they go align themselves with, the, with street guys. It's a different type of street guys. You got street guys that, that are extortionists. They don't, that's all they do. You know, the artist himself may not look at it as extortion. They look at it as it's just money. We making millions over here. I'm going to give you a little bit of it. But it's like they people need that street credibility. But it depends on, on the guy you go get that's supposedly so affiliated with the streets. You may have this guy you bring along that gives you street credibility. Uh, probably known in the hood. And he probably got a crew of guys that run with him, you know. 
and they can they can come ride down on a rapper or something and jump out and, and be the man, you know what I'm saying? But that that stuff don't always play out in the hood. You got some guys that's in the hip hop, then you go get these guys from the hood, yeah, they body body. You can go to the hood and cause havoc. You got some guys, they can come mob out on you, they can get you street credibility where you can move around and things of that nature, but they can't go back to the hood and cause chaos. Like, they don't have that respect like that in the hood. Then you got people that just bona fide street like uh, Supreme. This guy is bona fide street. is solidified when it comes to the streets. He's well known in Queens. He got this uh, godly-like image to folks that, in Queens. And... In my opinion, Murder Inc. sort of aligning up themselves with Supreme to get street credibility. But people like Supreme, he only think one type of way. I'm a hustler from the streets. That's it. So he felt like the way he can get his entertainment thing kicked off the ground was go through and be affiliated with Murder Inc. At the same time, Murder Inc. really need that street credibility having a guy like Supreme on their team. And he tried to do the right thing when he got out. Maybe this entertainment thing would take off for me while I don't have to sell drugs anymore. I don't have to do all these things in the street anymore. These guys right here, they they opening their arms from, for me. And it's all cool. I'm going to use it to my advantage. 50 Cent became a real problem for Murder, Inc. 50 Cent, he had made a controversial record uh, when he first started coming on the scene, it's called Ghetto Quran. He was originally found by the late great Jam Master J, but he had this album that was coming out on Columbia Records, and his Ghetto Quran record was on that album, and it depicted people like Supreme and Prince in this song. And many people consider that snitching, and I don't see how that is snitching when you have media coverage on these guys already. It's like when you get a guy from the hood, he want to be the uh, reporter of the streets. He's supposed to be the snitch. So, but 50 Cent himself said Supreme never, never expressed his, this ill feeling because of this record. Uh, 50 Cent was an upcoming rapper. Ja Rule was doing his thing. So 50 Cent goes over expecting this this good relationship with Ja Rule. Uh, according to them, Ja Rule sort of shushed him off. He was offended by that. He see that Prime is supporting these guys. And he's looking at it like, how can you go support some guys in Irv Gotti and their people and they're from Hollis? Then you got a rapper that's from Jamaica, Queen, whoever really Ja, ja Rule don't have that background of, as the thug on the streets, whereas 50 Cent actually lived that life. So he sort of got kind of offended by that. How can a guy that I looked at as a godfather to the streets and 50 Cent was a, a Supreme Team enthusiast like most people. He's a, a fan of it. So how can you go endorse these guys who ain't got no back, really no background of, of this thug shit, this thugging this on the streets so he sort of got offended by that so you know but he put this record out and many people think that he got shot because of this he got shot multiple times the album never came out but this song was out so many people wasn't familiar with the song especially around new york city now the first time i ever heard of 50 cent i was actually in new york city he had that record out called How to Rob. It was like in heavy rotation on the radio. I was like, this dude right here, fool. So when I went back to Detroit, like, man, this guy out there named 50 Cent, this dude clowning in this record, you know. And then Jay-Z mentioned him in one of his albums. So, you know, that brought a lot of notoriety to 50 Cent. Later on, you know, he ended up signing with Shady. Uh, but he got shot up. And many people think it's because of this song. I particularly think... Uh, it's because of this song. Uh, I, and we really just can't say that Supreme ordered that hit on 50 Cent because of this song. Like 50 Cent said, he didn't mention nothing about this song. So I guess when he ran into uh, what, whenever he dealt with Prem, it was all about Prem telling him to lead the Murder, Inc. 
click alone. This is how you eating right now. In 50 Cent's mind, that's extortion. In a lot of other people's mind, that's extortion. In Irv Gotti in their mind, they're like, that's not extortion. This is our man's. And most people from the streets, when you go get these guys so you can have street credibility, people in the streets, you know, they know you didn't run the turf with that guy. So, yes, they're going to look at it like it's extortion. You know, so apparently a lot of rappers, they get extorted by these street guys. You know, they pay for this street credibility. And I'm not saying that all rappers do that. You know, some of these guys come straight from the street. They from the turf and all that. So... Uh, but it's crazy though because when you get into entertainment you're supposed to be moving away from the streets you're supposed to be moving away from all that drama of the street mentality you know and 50 said like okay deal with me as well endorse me I would love to have a bona fide OG from my hood endorsing me he never got that from Supreme you know, you got people like Prem. Sooner or later, he's going to fall back into this, his old ways, feeling like he's the boss of Queens. He's the the bully of Queens. Everybody do what I do. Everybody do what I say. According to Tony Yayo, a lot of people were scared of Prem, but there was a few people that wasn't scared of Prem. 50 Cent was one of them. Like you, like uh, like I said, you can't say that Supreme ordered this hit, but he knew that it came from that side somewhere. So then you're dealing with Irv Gotti and John ja Rule and them, so they don't like Prime. Uh, but he said 50 Cent was one of those dudes that wasn't scared of Prime. And another guy named E Money Bags, he was another guy that wasn't scared of Prime. And when you really look at that. Supreme probably was aware of E Money Bags. You know how you get down and all that. But again, Prem felt like he's the boss of Queens and all that. Jay Z and Mob Deep. I thought this was pretty peculiar when I really looked at it because it was a time when Jay Z he was on the radio. He had a bunch of guys up there, they they freestyling on the radio. One of them had that Money Bags name, in which this E Money Bags guy got offended because he felt like Jay Z is aware of him. Jay Z know how he get down. Why would you go have one of your mans use my name? And E Money Bags was, you know, he was in the entertainment thing, but he was a for real street guy. You know, he, he hadn't had got that break in the music industry like that. Yeah, he was working on that, it seems. But he still was a bona fide street guy. So he got a problem with this guy using his money bag name on the radio with Jay-Z. Now, I had to agree with Jay-Z. And I don't like to get into that rap politic type stuff. You know, a lot of this stuff be corny and entertainment, you know. So I don't get involved in that stuff like that. I don't even like to talk about it. But, um... It was just a messed up moment because I think it's a little bit of distortion going on because these money bags who's sitting there with the guy from Mob Deep while all this is going on. So he want to get in, get in this radio station. He knew this guy Prodigy can call up there and, and pull some strings and make that happen where he can get on the phone with Jay-Z. To me, that's kind of corny, you know, because Jay-Z coming to the phone thinking it's this dude from Mob Deep. You get on the phone, it's E Money Bags. He done gave the phone to E Money Bag and he started campaigning about this name. All this is to a surprise to Jay Z. He really ain't sweating nobody names or whatever. He being a CEO, he trying to break artists and stuff like that. He ain't really looking at who taking who name and stuff like that. But this guy, E Money Bags, was offended by that. He felt like he really had a lot of power with Jay Z supposed to recognize that. Jay Z is rapping at this time. He ain't just paying attention. He know about you and all that, but to be aware of you because this guy, he just he felt that was kind of corny that you would call me and throw this guy on the phone. So of course he took the battle to the mob deep dudes and he did this summer jam type thing. He put this picture of the mob deep guy on there to embarrass him. Well, I guess he was looking like Michael Jackson or something, but. That was a corny move, and rest in peace to the Prodigy to a Mob Deep. So I'm not trying to smear his name or nothing like that. That's just some of the rap stuff they got going on, you know. But it's about this boy, this guy, E Money Bag. Excuse me, I ain't mean to call him boy, but uh, E Money Bag. So he a real for for real street guy, like he's in it 
for real. Like, this dude is street. And as the story goes, E-Money Bags wanted to get a, a vehicle. And Preen, stepping back into his old ways, you know, he tried to get into uh, the entertainment field. Um, I guess he thought working with a group like, uh, a company like Murder, Inc. and getting favorites for them, that this project was going to blow up. Don't quite work like that, you know. Some projects you got to be consistent with what you're doing. Sometimes it takes some type of deal or whatever. But you got such a when you build up those street type of names, you know that this mobster, this gangster, and people really don't want to deal with that stuff in like the corporate world. You know, it's kind of they throw you like in a box or something. You always had this title of being this drug dealer, this thug. And it's kind of hard to escape. And I'm sure Supreme felt some of that. Do you see that the real love is coming from the streets? The streets is begging for Preen to step back in the streets. So, you know, he got into this car thing and E Money Bags wanted to get this car, which he went to another person to get this car, and that person gave Preen the money. Some type of way, the guy wanted his money back. E Money Bags, he wanted his money back. Preen think he the bully, Preen think he the boss. He just bogarted this guy's money. He had probably heard about e-money bags. He probably heard how he move around. He probably heard that e-money bags command respect when he's around. And Supreme was not Supreme. You're not about to respect it. So he bogarted this guy's money. He wouldn't give it back. He probably didn't have it in the first place because he never could pick that Supreme team thing back up. Once he got out, started dealing with Murder, Inc. and all that and so, uh, spring team is basically over it by, at this point. So he don't have that big crack o operation going on. What, what he got is a lot of street status. So, but he wanted to bogart the guy money. He, the guy, he felt offended by that. A guy like E-Money Bags command respect. And people respected him. So he seen Preem and this guy Black just together. And shots were fired, whereas Black Jess ended up passing away. But the, the target was Supreme. This is guy E Moneybags, as reported, who let off these shots about his money. This is Gangsta Paradise Podcast. Make sure y'all subscribe to this channel. Go to my YouTube channel, Gangsta Paradise TV One. Subscribe over there. I put out a lot of documentaries. I call them docudramas. There's a lot of visuals on there. You can all go over there and check that out. Appreciate it. My love. And at this point, Preem in total shock that a guy would try this attempt on his life. You know, so it was on. It was on E Money Bags. At this point, it's all on site. So, um, but the guy offended that he just bogarted his money like that. He felt like he was praying he just keep people money. Like, dude, like, no, I'm not scared of you, Holmes. Passing away, which is unfortunate. Um, and being affiliated with Murder, Inc., Supreme never got off the radar of the law enforcement because they all knew he was affiliated with Fat Cat Nichols. He didn't get exactly get caught up in Fat Cat cases and all the stuff Fat Cat had going on, but they knew Fat Cat was the boss and they knew the Supreme team was supplied by these guys. They know they ran with that clique. They know they affiliated. So they always looked at Preem was that lucky one that didn't get catch no cases like that and was gone at the time. You know, a lot of those cats was doing time in prison. Pappy Mason, Fat Cat, uh, the guy on Glaze. So a lot of these guys were already locked up in prison. So they really always wanted to get Supreme, but he had to fall into his old ways and get himself locked up. So Murder Inc. ended up catching the case. And they started freezing all the assets. Uh, the money wasn't flowing in. These guys were making millions of dollars with this music stuff. You know that that pop hip hop stuff they was pushing um that stuff was paying off like i said i liked the stuff you know i wasn't a big fan of like they label and listening to all the artists and stuff like that but you know i like some of that music they were putting out it's kind of cool but 
at this point, you know, they freezing all their assets. They can't move around. They don't have the money coming in like that. They can't put up the money for um, Supreme to have a lawyer. So they all get indicted. Supposedly, reportedly, up there in Baltimore, operating up there. You know, Baltimore, that's kind of a hard place right there. It sort of reminds me of Detroit. You know, I was up there like last year. And um, it's kind of hard over there. You know, there ain't nothing to play around over there and be more. But they say he was up there operating. You know, uh, he got his hustle gang going on. At least that's what's reported. So by the time these all, all these guys get caught on these Fed charges, they got to fight these cases in which Murder, Inc., um, you know, I don't believe that they was using money from Preen to clean up, clean up his money. I don't believe they were doing stuff like that. I just don't believe that. But so they were affiliating themselves with Prime. Yes, they're gonna put those type of charges on you, uh, money laundering and things like that, because they feel like the only way Prime make money is sell dope, you know. But all the money that they got and the money they were able to use, they had to use it on their own lawyers. So they didn't have the money to to help Supreme out with his case. So he was on this case with a court-appointed lawyer on these murder charges, and he got found guilty. They say he was even um, um, fighting the death penalty, yeah, but he got found guilty, and he got to spend the rest of his life in jail. But the law enforcement always wanted that because they felt like he was a part of that destruction that happened with that crack era in the 80s. You know, they wanted to see all those guys nailed to the wall Especially about that cop Edward Byrne that got shot and killed. That came from that fat uh, Pappy Mason caught the charge from that fat cat Nichols. He was actually in prison when that happened, but he was calling a lot of shots while he was in prison. But he distanced himself from Pappy Mason and that whole shooting this cop thing. Uh, they knew what this cop died on Supreme Team. They they whole watch that '80s era. Then you had this probation officer that got killed. So it was people that's in law enforcement that was getting killed. So they were always offended by those guys that was running the 80s. The Supreme Team was one of those guys they just didn't like. You know, you don't supposed to shoot no cop <laughs> blatantly like that, you know. But you got a guy like Pappy Mason who was very brazen like that, you know. He was a brazen individual to even order a hit like that. At least that's reported that he did this. You know, but a lot of those guys still locked up in jail who actually carried out the, the hit. So all that still was hanging over Supreme's head. You know, he tried to come out and probably tried to be legit. And that stuff just didn't work out. And how long you think Murder, Inc. going to carry you if your, your project's not working? You know, so um, that's just how it is in the music business, entertainment it business. You can lose a lot of money. You know, a lot of people lose a lot of money before they actually make money. Um, but he end up catching his cases. They get found guilty. He got to spend the rest of his life in jail. The Supreme Team, they got uh, like a documentary or something that's out right now. And I really believe sooner or later they're going to make a series based upon this gang, this gang right here. You know, they just too popular just to ignore. So it's, it's going to be coming soon, sooner or later. But I just wanted to let my audience know more about the Supreme Team. It's public information. They're very popular. You know, I get a lot of emails from people from other countries. They want to be know about that black culture. And this was a heavy, popular gang in New York City during that time. The Supreme is like the godfather uh, of Queens. And people to this day still highly respect this guy. I believe 50 Cent. Even still, some type of way, respects this guy. Even though he got shot and he felt like it came from that side. But to say he directly blamed Supreme, I don't know. But they didn't like Supreme. And like I say, it's always unfortunate. This is Gangsta's Paradise Podcast. I'll be looking for my next episode. I'll be coming back with something soon. You know what I always say. Keep your head up and stay positive.